Uh, welcome to the 8th Andrea and Charles Bronfman Lecture of Israeli Studies, uh, pre uh, presented by David Grossman on meeting with the writer and his books. My name is Emmanuel Adler, and I'm the Andrea and Charles Bronfman Charles Bronfman Studies. Uh, this uh, 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 lecture is sponsored by the Bronfman Chair, the Center of Jewish study, uh, Studies, and the Faculty of Arts and Science. Thanks go to Professor Hindi Nyman, who currently heads the Center for Jewish Studies, to Professor Derek Spencer, former director of the Program of Jewish Studies, uh, who we jointly conceived uh, the and David uh, uh, to U of T. Dean upon getting notice of our idea, immediately decided to support it, and to interim Dean Meg uh, Gertler, uh, who fully committed himself to support David Grossman's visit. I also would like to thank my wife, Sylvia Adler, uh, from Israeli Studies, Jackie Vanterpool from the Dean's Office, and Rita O'Brien from Political Science Department for helping organize this magnificent event. And I will ask everybody to put the uh, <laughs> phones off, please. And to all of you, uh, David Grossman's public, welcome and thank you for attending this event. Uh, leading Israeli novelist uh, David Grossman was born in Jerusalem in 19... Well, we have a proliferation of telephones today. Uh, so maybe we should take a second to get them off completely. So let's start again. Uh, leading Israeli novelist David Grossman was born in Jerusalem in 1954. He studied at the Hebrew University. Uh, we have studied at the Hebrew University. <laughs> um, and later worked as an editor and broadcaster at Israeli Radio. Grossman has written several novels, a number of short stories, a number of books for children and youth. He has also published several books of non-fiction, including The Yellow Wind in 1988, one of the most controversial and best-selling books in Israeli history, which Palestinians. And among Grossman's uh, many literary awards are the Vallombrosa Prize, the Indian uh, Prize, Prize, the Premium, Premium on Exact uh, Kid, uh, these are uh, in Italy in 1996, the Vittorio De Sica Prize, the Juliet Club Prize, Children's Literature in Translation, this is from the UK, the Buchtut Bull Prize, the one to run with, the Bialik Prize, the Correct Jewish Book Award in the U.S., the Rome Peace Prize, and uh, the Emet uh, 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 Prize uh, in Israel. It also has been awarded the Chevalier de All the Arts de Belletres in France, and an honor honorary doctorate from Florence University this year. In, 19, uh, in 2007, of Interim Grammar and See Under Love uh, were named among the 10 most important of the state of Israel. His latest novel, Until the End of the Land, Isha Burachat Mi Besora, was published in Hebrew this year, and we are in its translation <coughs> into English. <laughs> the book has been referred to as David Grossman's best novel yet, which is an incredible tall order that these other novellas are among the best an Israeli writer has ever produced, been translated into languages. Israeli identity and students over here. I often describe David. Uh, uh, wind as a trip to the mind of the Palestinian people. With other novels or non-fiction, however, I can think about See Under Love and Isha Borachat Mi Besora, are trips to the mind of the Israeli people, its fears and anxieties, its enormous complex feelings, and most important, its tragedy. David was forced to experience in, those, in his own heart and flesh not so long ago. As Tova Mirvis wrote in the New York Times several years ago, the Israeli reality Grossman evokes is known as the situation, in Hebrew, Hamata. Only nine words that emanate from the Intifada to the security fence to the coming withdrawal from Gaza, this was written in 2005. The situation is not but every event. 
It bleeds into every part of life. Grossman's this uneasy place where the external realities of politics stricken inner experience of individuals. He writes of marriage and desire, jealousy and motherhood, loyalty and betrayal, and all the while he's mapping an entire country's anxieties and rather than explicitly report the facts on the ground, Grossman constructs its own alternate the results are more immediate, more richly true in this situation, I must have in any situation. All this says a lot about David, the writer, and his books. But an introspective look at the person uh, behind his book and public speeches, I also had the fortune to uh, uh, with him just uh, uh, last, in, during the last hour, also shows so fair, writer, larger than life, but also a mensch. Welcome to the University of Toronto, David. The floor is yours. And Before leaving the floor to David, I just would like to announce that uh, after uh, David's talk, uh, of course, we'll have uh, a Q&A period, questions and answers. And you will not need the microphones on the side as we always uh, tend to have because the microphone will uh, uh, will catch your, your questions and answers. So just, just the floor. And thank you for all the, the good things you, you have said about me. And now I have time these expectations which is for the situation of uh, in or uh, well I'd to bore both you and, and myself I'll talk about my writing, and uh, maybe the first thing I'll start with is the the very usual question of how how do I start to write a book? How do I start to write a novel? And there are as many answers as novels, I think, because each novel creates its own beginning generates the the process of writing it and sometimes it comes with total surprise when i'm i'm not prepared even to start writing and sometimes it comes when i'm almost yearning to to start a novel yearning because i have to to tell you you do not know me but the periods between novels are the ones that i like uh, less and less. Uh, I feel that when I write, things are interwoven in such a rewarding way for me. Everything that happens in life, everything that I see, every person that I meet, every conversation I eavesdrop on uh, when I'm on a bus or walking in the street. When I write, there is almost nothing that is trivial not the smallest anecdote. Of course, not even the, 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 a person that I just met by chance, even though he cannot be trivial because he, he will radiate or she will radiate something to me that will explain, will teach me something. While writing, I feel I'm in, in much more receptive uh, situation. While when I'm not in writing process, things just come one after the other. They are not interwoven. They are not loading each other with, with significance. Uh, and therefore, usually, I try immediately when I finish a novel to start a new one. Uh, or let's say after a certain period of, of recovering from, from the previous novel, because some of the novels that I've written were devastating to me. I hope they were also devastating to you in, in a way. I will tell you about 
one book that was a kind of a recovery book from a devastation, dev devastation and that was a someone to run with, Mishewu Laruzito. And I started this novel uh, after I had finished another one, uh, Be My Knife, Shetihilia Sakin, which was quite a tough novel, a tough novel about a tough person. It's a kind of an epistolar love story uh, a man see a woman, saw a woman uh, in a, re a reunion party at school. He falls in love with her. He does not really understand that he's falling in love. But he feels this uncontrollable urge to tell her his story, to tell her the story of his life. And, and he even tells her, with you, I do not want a story on the side. He's married, she's married. I don't want a story on the side. With you, I want a story. I want to tell you this story. And, and he writes her almost a suicidal letter asking her to, to accept him. Asking her to accept him, to, to, to contain him. And, and, and she agrees. She agrees because she's this kind of person. And they start to correspond. And in the beginning, his, his letters are flooding her. There is something really uncontainable in, 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 in what he writes, in his personality, in his borderlessness. And gradually, slowly, slowly, she is able to, to, to mold him, to shape him, and to direct him to, to his real self that has been distorted and manipulated since he was a child. And gradually, they create for themselves this hermetic verbal territory, which maybe is another definition of intimacy and maybe even of, uh, of love. And it becomes so intimate that I, I think that the reader feels in a way that they are peeping into something so private, maybe even too private, that it can be almost upsetting. And I, like, I liked it to be so. I wanted it. Uh, to be like that. I wanted that the reader will feel almost intrusive into this intimacy of, of the two. And I wrote it for four years. And when, when it was over, I was really, I was quite devastated. I felt that uh, so many things in my own life had been unearthed. And I wanted to write immediately another love story. Because this love story, the being my knife story, is not a simple, straightforward love. Maybe because the man in the story, Yair, is a person that before he gives, he has to take, and before he opens a door, he puts seven fences around him. And I wanted to write, as I said, you know, a kind of a more harmonious love story. And I had I had the urge and the desire for writing it, but I just didn't have an idea. Small problem. <laughs> and, and in such days, I know I, I walk, you know, I, I feel all the cells in my body are open to, to, to receive the clue from the world, because I know it will come. If I'm only attentive and, and, and sharp enough to, to receive it. And then one day, it was January, uh, I, I left home and I was about to enter my car to meet with a friend. I live in, in a place called Mevaser Zion, just out of Jerusalem on the way to Tel Aviv, 10 minutes from Jerusalem. And <clears throat> a man approached me and he was leading a dog. And he said, excuse me, do you know this dog? And I said, no, why do you ask? And he said, please have a second look. I'm chasing this dog, walking after this dog, actually, since 8 in the morning. It was something like 12 or even 1 o'clock. And I, I looked at the dog, and I think I know all the dogs in, in my neighborhood, but this one was not familiar. And the dog was, you know, a dog of Mevaseret. It's a well-invested dog, you know. <laughs> and, and, but, 
But the rope, that uh, the leash that he was held by was something that was collected from, from the, the pavement, the sidewalk. And I asked the person, why would you go after this dog? Why would you follow it? And he said, uh, you see, it's a lost dog, a stray dog. And I believe that if I follow it, it would lead me to its owner. Now, I was uh, really uh, struck by such uh, act of uh, generosity and in Mevaseret, which is not common. And I said, wow, chapeau that you are doing it, that you are investing so much uh, time and energy. And he said, chapeau, shmapo. I work in the sanitation department. This is how we find the owners of lost dogs. And believe me, he said, he's going to pay a high fee for wasting my time. <laughs> and, it's true. It's a, it's a true story. And he showed me the form. There is form 76, and it's written exactly, and you have to pay. I looked at him, you know, as if my guarding angel appeared, and I, I sat in my car, and I just felt, you know, I have such a story. Because, okay, now, the dog, the one who follows the dog, he will be a man, and the owner of the dog, she will be a woman. Now, the dog will not go directly to the owner, because if it, if it does, uh, I don't have a story. The dog, <laughs> the dog has its own agenda. So the dog will take the man through different stations in, in, in Jerusalem until he will bring him to the owner. And then I thought that I, I wanted to write a book for youngsters, because usually I have this rhythm of ri writing a book for grown-ups, childish grown-ups maybe, and then writing a book for very mature children or, or very mature uh, adolescents. And, and uh, so the, the, the one behind the dog on the tail side will be 16 years old, Asaf, and the girl will be Tamar, 16 years old, Tamar. And, and through all the stations that the dog will lead Asaf, she will, or it will, the dog will initiate him to this great love of Tamar, because he has to be prepared to, to love Tamar. He's not yet, he's not mature enough. Uh, Tamar is much more mature person than, than, than Asaf. So that's how the story started, and I wrote it. I think it was the fastest written book for me, something like nine months, and I, I just felt I just don't have to stand in the way of the story, just to allow it to, to unfold and to lead me, you know, I was like the man, you know, in the cartoon, this movement, movement I was like the man after the dog <laughs> chasing the story. The second problem is how to end the story. Uh, so first, I should say that I never, while writing, I never, never know the ending of a story. Never. I don't want to know the ending because in the moment I know it, and there is always a moment that one has to know the, the end of his, so his story, it starts to, to fade out from me. I'm much less intrigued by it. It does not contain these you know, explosives that, that I need in order to, to continue writing it. I need the book that I'm writing. I need it to surprise me all the time. I want to be surprised. And more than that, I want the book to betray me in the sense that the book should take me to places that I will try not to go to or I will be very reluctant to go to in my usual protected uh, life. And I want the, the, the book that I write to unearth all the, the basic premises, to, to jar my basic premises and to 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 tell me things about myself that I I'm reluctant to hear and things that I do not hear from any other outer sources maybe it's something like you hear only in your dreams this information that we receive from ourselves but at the same time it is also external and it, it has a significance that is very deep to us. It's hard to decode. And yet, if we manage to decode it, it's, it's, it's very rewarding. But between the beginning and the ending of the writing process, there is the writing process. And 
this is for me, if I have to, to say what is writing for me now at this phase of, of my life, because it, it changed in the past and I guess it will change in the future. But this time is writing is the, the, the way to, to, un to understand other people from within, from inside. And may I elaborate on that a little? I think that usually in our life, especially in our modern life, we are quite protected from other people. We are quite protected from the interiority of other people, even from people who are very close and precious for us. You know, we are, of course, protected. It's very natural, not very positive or, or useful, but we are protected from the interiority of our enemies. It is not useful, and I, I, I will, would like to say something about it later. But this is understandable. It's almost an instinct to block yourself against the, the story of your enemy, against the suffering or the justice, misery of your enemy. But we are also quite protected in a very cunning and efficient and subtle way, also from the interiority of our precious ones. And sometimes, of course, present company excluded, not here in Toronto, you are much too good to, to be an example for that, but sometimes, you know, in remote places like Israel, I see couples who are married together for 30, 40 years, and they are really very good as, as a couple. They function well, and they are wonderful parents, and they, are, they created wonderful family, and they love each other very much. And yet, if you look at them carefully, sometimes you can see, almost visualize, how in the moment of their fertilization as a couple, they made a deal, a silent, and a mute agreement between them not to see the other from all possible angles of this other, not to see him or her from all these angles that really makes him an other. And they decided you know, to, to strike this deal to evocate only certain aspects of this other throughout their life. And they also decided that their love will win at any price, of course, but there is a price for it. There is a price for not evocating all all the aspects that makes this one a full human being. Because if you do not evocate these elements in your most significant partner, significant other, and if, if he or she doesn't do the same for you, so many of, of your essential dimension might congeal, will not be flexible, will not be you know, vital, vibrant. We see it also between parents and children. And we are all the most loving parents, of course, and caring for our children. But how much are we threatened and frightened by the dark corners of, of our children? How much we are reluctant to be exposed to these places in the mind, in the souls of, of our children? and it happens between you know, the two best friends, there is this certain mechanism of almost anonymity. I, I think of this couple, the, the clowns from Waiting for Godot, Vladimir and Estragon. One of them says, I had a dream. Don't tell me immediately. The other one tells him, reject it. Don't tell me. So he asks, to whom shall I tell my private nightmares? nightmares? Keep them private. I don't want to keep them private. And, and I think sometimes we think that when, when we make love, we really know the other, really know the other. In Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew, there, there is this, the word is the same, to know, to know a woman. Adam yada et chava ishto, and Adam knew his wife Eve. But of course, in, in such moments, we are tuned 
more or only to the more attractive, beautiful, sweet elements of our partner, not to the elements of him or her being uh, di distorted, tormented, miserable, ugly, not at all. Not to everything that makes this other an other. But when we write about a character, the tendency, the direction of the movement is just the opposite of reluctance, just the opposite of protecting oneself from this other that you write his story or her story. The tendency is really to bereft yourself totally, to surrender totally to whatever this character can suggest to you and can evocate within you, and really to allow it to take over you. At the same time, you keep another eye, a kind of third eye open to document this taking over. But we are so used to these third eyes of documenting and it's so rare to allow ourselves to surrender in, in such a way. There is such sweetness in this surrendering to it. And when I say surrendering, I mean really to allow yourself to be this other one. I, I remember 20 years ago, even more, 22, 86, I just uh, published a... Uh, See under love, and I was on a bus driving from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. It was 7:30 in the evening, and on the radio of the bus there was the news magazine, the evening news magazine, and in the end of it there was the culture corner. You know, usually they put the co the culture in corners so it will not overflow and flood us. God forbid. So I was listening two minutes, you know, and there was this Israeli actor who suddenly, to my great amazement, read some excerpts, I think, from, from See Under Love about Gizela. Gizela is the mother of uh, Momik. Momik is the main protagonist of the book. He's nine years old. He's the only son of two Shoah survivors, Holocaust survivors, who would never talk to him about the Shoah, and he's terrified, and he's threatened, and with all the, the despair of a child that must decode the riddle of his parents, the riddle of reality, he, he tries to understand from all kind of fragments that he grasps from them, from, from conversations that are being hushed down when he enters the room, from fragment of cries out of nightmares of his father. He tries to juxtapose all these broken information into something coherent. And he creates for himself the reality of the country of over there, the country of over there, as, as, as he calls it, because his parents are, they never say Poland or Germany, as it was when I was a child. Nobody really said the explicit names. It was so frightening. So people said over there, sham. And by the way, I, I, I think of that, that in every language that Jews are speaking about the Shoah, they are speaking about what happened over there. Sham, Dort. When non-Jews are speaking about the Shoah, they almost always will speak about what had happened then. There is an, a, a major difference between there and then. Then means done over no more. When you say over there, well, you hint, you suggest that somewhere parallel to our reality, it's still an option. That's just a side thought. Sitting in the bus, listening to the description of Gisela, the mother of Momik, sitting at her Zinger sewing machine, you remember, with the pedal, the wheel on the side. And, and I heard that her foot rest on a wooden pedal that was added to the additional origin, to the original metal pedal of the Zinger. And at that very point, the driver 
who was just a human being, how much can he bear these texts? He switched on to another cheerful station. <laughs> I was quite hurt, I must tell you. <laughs> I can laugh now, 22 years, it's laughable, but... <laughs> and I was left there with both the insult for my poor text, but also with this Mr. Why did I put this additional requisite of the wooden pedal to the Zinger machine? Who needs it? I mean, it works wonderful. I remember from my mother the way she did it. There was nothing. And I couldn't understand why did I do it. Because you do not just throw articles and objects into your story. There, there must be some reason, even, even if it's not known for me you know, logically. Probably I had some thought about it. I came back home and I took the book from the shelf and I opened and I found some phrases later that Gisela, the mother of Momik, was so fat and short that her legs wouldn't reach the pedal. So Uncle Shimek, who has good hands and who knows how to cheat on income tax, he fixed her another wooden pedal. And then suddenly, because of this very little Example, I suddenly understood what, what literature is all about, at least for me. Because, you know, I, I'll tell you frankly, maybe if I read this book some years after I had written it, probably I would not have noticed that something is missing there. All of my writers, not even most of them, would not have noticed that something is missing there between her leg and the and uh, her foot and uh, the pedal. But there would be a kind of a little void, just a little void here and maybe another place here and here and here. And gradually the reader will start to feel that this writer did not do his job rightly, that he did not, he did not really you know, kill himself on the text, for the text. And I think that if, well, I should say, I should add also that in my normal, usual life at home, if there is something to be fixed in electricity, shutter, plumbing, uh, whatever, you know, it will take me some weeks and my wife will say, no, well, it's about time, you know, we are sitting in the dark for some weeks and, and leave me all kind of nasty notes. And only when my... Uh, position, which is doubtful to start with as the father of this family, only when it really deteriorates, then I'll go and fix the things. But when you write a story, and you have such a character like this poor Gisela, and while writing Gisela, you become Gisela, and you do everything as Gisela. You know, you think how Gisela is chasing the bus in the market in Jerusalem with two heavy baskets and how her legs are wrapped with bandages and how she suffers because of her legs. And if you allow yourself to become Gisela for several days or weeks, then out of yourself it would emerge this additional pedal that you will not even think about it. I, I must tell you, I, I, when I wrote it, I did, it was not something that I planned it. It, was, it just f flew out. And this is what, what I tried to describe earlier as, as this total surrendering to, to the character. And this is what I spoke about, this sweetness of the totality, because there must be totality when you write a novel. You are the only one who is responsible for this great family of, of the characters in your, in your story. Sometimes I think of it like hiding a very big family in, in a cellar under the ground during war. There are 60, 70 characters, people there. You are the only one who has to come once or twice a day to feed them to feed their bodies with concrete food, to feed their mind by talking to them about what happens out of, of the, the pit in which they are, 
to try to ventilize their mind, to show them that there are other, some hopes or some chances that they will be out, maybe to solve their problems. And you also have to take their nighty pots out. Between this and that, you have to prevail totally, just to allow yourself to be there totally. If you don't do it, the reader will feel immediately. It's very obvious. But if you do it again, you will have this, this sweetness of totality that I do not know from any other part of my life. Because usually for everything we do, there are other people who are capable of taking our place. Almost in every function of our life, they might do it worse than us, maybe better than us, but we are replaceable. When you write a story, when you create a novel or any artistic creation, nobody will do this, this thing for you. No one will devote himself or herself in, in uh, such a way. Where did, where did I start it? I don't remember. Oh, how, how we start a novel. You know, maybe I'll answer some of your questions now. I don't know what time it is, but... You know, ask me questions, and I, I will thank you very much for literary question and try to postpone the political ones <laughs> to the last 10 minutes of, of the... A political corner? Ah, <laughs> political corner, that's good. Our revenge. Yes, please, you. Who that just read someone to run with, and uh, I did not lead the group, but I understand that you did a lot of research for for that uh, book. Did you, among young people? I mean, uh, how did you get into their minds? It's two different, separate questions. One is the question of the research, and one is how to get into their mind. Uh, the research is the part of writing that I, I like very much. You know, it takes me out of my home and it uh, forces me to go in, into quite strange, bizarre places. Uh, when I was writing Someone to Run With, uh, I spent many, many nights uh, in the squares in Jerusalem, in places where the drug addict youngsters are gathering. Uh, they allowed me in uh, the first time. Was very I was very lucky because there were two. Well, they were almost children. I think they were fourteen, and they they knew me from the zigzag kid, and they approved me to the others, and it was really so heartwarming because they they just opened themselves up for me. And I sat with them for nights and nights, and they just allowed me to write down whatever they said and the way they spoke, and they have a special sub-language, a special dialect of their own. Uh, and it was, you know, I must say that until I started writing about them, I was not aware of how many they were you know, we always have this mechanism of not seeing what we do not want to see. Once it was formulated to me, I, I saw them everywhere. And they, they are everywhere if, if, you, if you just open your eyes. Uh, two of these kids died in the course of writing the book because, they, because of AIDS. They are prostituting themselves. They use the same needle. 10, 12, 15 people, you know, you know these, these stories. Uh, to enter their mind is something uh, quite different. Uh, it is as difficult as to enter the mind of any other other. Uh, I'm fascinated by adolescence. I wrote a lot about adolescence. Uh, I think about this process of maturing physically and emotionally. It, it is such a major phase in, in our life. Suddenly, at the age of 12 or 13, we enter this tunnel from which we shall emerge when we are 
17 or 18. Today, I think it's uh, 27, 28. It <laughs> has been prolonged lately. And we shall come out with a different body, different mind, new desires and urges will take over us. And we are just subject to this huge process that overtakes us. Uh, it's a very normal process, but maybe there will be kids, children, who would regard it as a kind of arbitrariness. They did not choose this process. I wrote in, in the book of Intimate Grammar, uh, Sefer Adikduk Pnimi, I wrote about Aaron, a Jerusalemite child, who is like you know, a sparkle of light and life and imagination. And at a certain age, 12, 13, when all his friends start to mature physically, in a way he cannot collaborate with this procedure of the flesh, with this uh, bureaucracy of, of the glands. And he suspends himself. He doesn't grow up for three long, tormented years. He doesn't grow up mature physically because he does not want to join this process that everybody else joins because he feels that if he did, something of him would be confiscated. He has to do everything his own way. He has to keep his uniqueness, his idiosyncrasy. So he just does not grow up and he realizes that his way to maintain his uniqueness, his way not to join the others is also through the language. He becomes more and more aware of the language the peop that people use. He realizes that, that people are using the language in a very irresponsible way, in a kind of an indifferent and obtuse way. And he feels that his personal imprint would be through the language and the words that he chooses. So he first he creates for himself another new brain, because the old brain failed him, did not make him mature, did not make him normal. Yeah, he is very ambivalent for not maturing. On the one hand, he doesn't want. On the other hand, he very much wants to be like the other. But he decides to do it his own way. So under his heart, he creates a little bubble, imaginary one, of course, of the new brain. But he understands that for this new brain, he has to create a new language. So he takes words that he absorbs from the outside, from the conversations of his parents, from the street conversation, from the papers, from the radio. He smuggles them from the old brain to the new brain. And he creates there a hospital for sick words <laughs> in which he purifies them word by word. And only then he feels he is entitled to express them. Only then they are his words. And I think, for me, this book is, is the, if you don't mind me saying so, is the portrait of the artist, of a young man, as, as a writer. Because I always feel that, that writers are people who, by nature, they feel claustrophobic in words that other people have used. And they just, it's almost physical, you know, this need to, to break through this uh, suffocation and to, to use your own, to breathe your own air, to use your own, uh, your own words, words that you feel that you are entitled to use because they are yours, because you, you really intend to their interiority. You do not just approach them from, from the outside. And this book is, is about what does it mean to be an adolescent, about this such loneliness of being an adolescent. I, I think everyone wants to be young, but very few really wants to, be, to go back to be adolescents, yeah? And it's, I think that because of this loneliness, solitude of the adolescents, and because of this realization, understanding, sorry, that they are undergoing such a massive and maybe also intrusive process that they need to, to be in big herds, in big groups, and to make a lot of noise and, and strong music and, and strong activities in order to, to silence this whisper inside their brain that tells them that right now you are so much in your fate. 
you are now undergoing something that is going to affect you all your life, and you are totally alone in that. And, and when I write about adolescence, and I wrote, I think, in three or four books, I really try to bring myself to this, to this place, to this loneliness, to this tunnel of adolescence. Yes, yeah. It, it's it's a book that was published, as uh, as you and uh, Emmanuel said, it was published in Israel and in Italy only until now. It will be here in, in I think a year time. Uh, and I, I'll just say some words about it. It's it's a book that I started writing in uh, 2003, uh, five years and a half ago, uh, and. It it's a book about uh, a family in Israel, and uh, the main character, one of the, the three, the two or three main characters is a woman, Ora, and she's a mother of two sons, and one of them goes to a military operation, and she has a very strong intuition that something will happen to him. And she decides... Uh, she decides not to collaborate with uh, with this fear and not to collaborate with the possibility that the representatives of the army will come and announce what happened to her son. In Israel, there is this machinery which is very sophisticated of uh, the way they come and announce you this uh, news. And she understands that it, it takes two for bad news, one to deliver and one to receive. So she says, I will not be there to receive. In a very magical, maybe pathetic thought, but very natural at such situations, she decides to escape. And she escapes from her home near Jerusalem until the end of the land. This probably will be the name of the book in English, to the very north of Israel. And on her way, she sweeps with her, she takes with her a man, Avram, who was the love of her youth, and maybe he is the love of her life. She's not married to him. And she takes him with her, and they start to wander, walking, yeah, by foot, in the Galilee, trying to escape from home and from the bad news. And she also understands that the only thing that she can do now to protect her son is to tell the story of his life to Avram, who gradually becomes more and more interested in, in the life of this young man of Ophir, their son, her son, and their son, I should say, yeah. But you will forget it until you will read it in a year. Uh, and uh, she tells him about the very, the small details of creating a child from the moment this child was conceived 
through the pregnancy, the birth, the breastfeeding, all the minutia of life, all the thousands and thousands of details of actions, of attempts, of mistakes, of wishes, of prayers, everything that it takes to accumulate one human being in this world. And she very gradually creates this offer, this human being, as almost as if he was alive in front of the eyes of Avram, of this man. And she walks with him and she tells him the story I, I should say maybe that I did the same walk that they did from the Galilee until my my home in, in the center of Israel, in near Jerusalem, in Mavaseret, uh, which was one of the best parts of writing this story, to walk these 500 kilometers and to discover how beautiful Israel is and, and to enjoy something that is so rare to enjoy in Israel because Israel is a very tzafuf, how do you say, cramped, crowded, crowded country and, and suddenly you can be alone in the nature and you can you know, just surrender to the nature and you can see things that otherwise you never see and to meet animals that you don't get to meet. And it was such a pleasure because being in the nature is something so comforting and so opening. And when you are in the nature, you meet other people sometimes who are walking on this trail, people that usually, if I met them in any other context of life, probably we, we would start to argue about politics. Many of them were settlers, for example. Uh, because they go out of ideology, you know, they want to, to to make a statement by walking on on the ground. And and when we met, we started to talk. And I, there is a character in this book uh, that they meet, uh, and he asks every person that he meets, he asks him or her two questions: What do you? regret in your life and what do you long for? I think for some minutes, some seconds, okay? <coughs> now, I must admit that it was me, this character, because when I uh, went to, to do this trip, I thought I want to, to have a way to talk with people, but not small talk only, but really to, to get something. And, and all the answers that are quoted in the book of these two questions are authentic answers of people who, who answered me. Now what amazed me was the immediacy of the responses. As if people just waited to be asked this question that can really devastate you, you know, it's not an easy, not easy questions to, to deal with. And people answered. You ask why there is not a clear ending to, to this book, yeah? Well, usually in my, in most of my books there is not clear ending, because I, I don't believe in clear ending, it's artificial, it's, you know, I mean, only life ends, but, but while we are, wh while living, while we are alive, things change and, and the next time you will read the book, you will read it totally different. And I don't want to put, you know, a full stop. I remember when uh, in, in the book of Intimate Grammar, in the end of it, Aaron, he enters a, an abandoned refrigerator outside some of the, the in, in one of the wadis next to his home in Jerusalem, and he wants to be like the new Jewish Houdini. Houdini was also Jewish, yes, but he wants to be the new Israeli Houdini. And, and the, the refrigerator locks, and we don't know if he will be able to get out of it. You cannot imagine how many letters I received of people, <laughs> truly, who asked, 
tell us that he went out of. And of course he went out. I mean, otherwise this story had not been written. But, but I, I don't think that I should say it. I mean, I, what I wanted is, and what I answered the, the, the readers who asked me is, do you want him to get out of the refrigerator? And they said, yes. I said, so he's out. You, you brought him out. <laughs> I think this is, this is, the, this is the answer. And, and so in this, uh, in this story, I, I knew from the very beginning of writing it that the ending will remain open. After what happened to me and to my family, uh, I continued to know that this ending of this story must remain, remain open, that I don't want to, to conclude it in any way. Of course, readers who read it today read it in, in the echo box of reality, and they know what happened in reality. But they also, I think, after having read it, they also might want that, that this boy, that, that this author will be saved from that. So I couldn't, and I didn't want to take this, you know, for me, easy step of cutting and, and ending it. And I think that a book that doesn't end in an artificial way, it leaves some taste of, of more. You know, there is a kind of unfinished business, and we know that unfinished business are the things that occupies us for, for a lot of time. Other questions? Yes. I know the invitation that your books have been translated into many languages, and I see you speak one of them perfectly. Thank you. Um, um, I Can I have it in writing? <laughs> <laughs> so I, was, I thought you must have a lot of thoughts on um, problems in the world, uh, translating Hebrew into modern languages. Uh, if, if I read some of them, you asked, Ingrid? What, what did you say in the last few words? Yes. The more I write and the more I read translations of, of my own books, which I try not to do, and I can read only English, a little Italian, and some Arabic. That's what I can do. The more I think that there is a major mistake in the whole idea of translation. Things cannot really be translated. <laughs> there are so many nuances and so many subcolors and shades in every phrase. How can it be translated? How can one really understand all the echoes and connotations and associations, all these layers of consciousness when they are transferred to another language? Now, I grew up, like all of us, on translations. And we got something from it. And they affected us. And they created us to be what we are. And yet, I think that in translation we get only what fifty percent. We do not get the whole, the whole world of of the writer. I'm sorry to to cast gloom on this event. Yes, but this is what I feel. I, I was blessed with very good translators, especially to English throughout uh, my writing years. Uh, and and yet I know that things that create such a wave of association in Hebrew. They don't have this wave in English. Maybe there are other waves that I'm not aware of, that I cannot know. But probably when you read the translation, you read another story. I'm sorry to say it. I know it sounds terrible. A writer should not say something like that. But this is my feeling. I feel that I, mean, I feel I myself only in the Hebrew. Yes. What prompted you to write lines and music? It's such an unusual uh, topic. Uh, you refer to Lion's Honey. It's it's an essay, but also a, a kind of a story about Samson, the biblical Samson. And uh, I, I got an offer from Canongate. It's a, a, a British uh, publisher 
who, who addressed some, I think, 20 writers, among them uh, Margaret Atwood, your Margaret Atwood, uh, who wrote about uh, Penelope, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and I wrote, uh, I thought that I should choose, I wanted to choose a biblical hero uh, because the definition of the request was to write about a mythological character that you like. And, and uh, I cannot say I like Samson, but he's from my mythology, from the Bible. And I, I study Bible now for 19, 18 years. Uh, I have a, a Chavruta. Chavruta is this very ancient Jewish institute of two people. We are three, of course. We must be different. We are three, two men and a woman. And, and we study the Bible as Jews have done it and are doing it throughout uh, history. You know, we, we are reading the Bible or the Gemara, the Talmud or the Mishnah with magnifying glass. And sometimes we can spend two, three months on one phrase or one paragraph. And there are so, I mean, so much can be said again and again and from totally new angle and from the, the spirit, the zeitgeist, the spirit of this period, unlike the spirit of other periods. And the Bible is written in such a condensed crystal way that you can project so many things about it and to fill all the gaps that he's not telling. I think, for example, about this story about some uh, Jacob and, and Leah and Rachel. You know, he Jacob worked for Leah, for Rachel. Sorry, fourteen years. In the beginning, he worked seven years, and uh, at the, the night of the wedding, her father Lavan. How do you say Lavan in English? Lavan. And the Aramite Lavan, and and he <laughs> white, and uh, <laughs> and he brought he brought to the wedding tent. He didn't bring Rachel, whom Jacob loved and desired, but he brought Leah, her eldest sister, who was probably less beautiful than her and had less chances to get married. And Jacob entered the room, the the tent. And he spent the night there, and he made love to Leah nine times, by the way. <laughs> this is not the Bible saying. This is Thomas Mann in Joseph and Brothers, nine times. Yeah, I see some faces here. Try to control your envy, OK? I mean, <laughs> I no, no. <laughs> I always comfort myself that exactly as the Methuselah lived 900 something years, they only had another system of calculation then. It's not, <laughs> trust me, it's not nine times. Can't. And, and in the morning, it's written only five words in Hebrew. And in the morning, and there she is Leah, in very clumsy translation. Just think of the, the heartbreaking drama that hides behind these five words. And for thousands of years, Jews tried to fill these gaps. What had happened in this tent? How can it be that he mistook her? Or maybe he did not mistake her. Maybe he wanted to be misled. Maybe he had his, his calculations. Maybe suddenly he felt sympathy to Leah being himself the less beloved brother between him and Esau. There's so many speculations. So you can really flourish with these options. And I wrote about Samson, uh, who is such a tragic character. And when you read his story, the biblical story, as I, as I read it, suddenly you see nuances that I have overlooked earlier. You know, I thought of him as this bully who used to kill thousands of and thousands of Philistines, who fought with the, the, the lion, a giant who slept with the, the whore in Gaza. But if you read it carefully, you see what a tragic person he is. And you see how he was doomed always to choose women that will betray him. 
This was his first choice always, to choose a woman that he knew in advance, ahead, that she will betray him. And, and he had to do it because he was betrayed even before being born. He was betrayed by his mother. And I, I will not elaborate on it now because you haven't read the book. But it was such a, a spiritual adventure to, to, to discover all this world and, and to discover how Samson is relevant to us today in Israel as Israelis, as Jews, in his approach towards power, for example, in the way he becomes aggressive because he is never sure that he really owns this power, since all his relationship with this power are not natural, not harmonious. It was a power that was implanted within him, or was, was imposed on him. So he's almost doomed to make mistakes with this power. And it's also about his uniqueness. This uniqueness of a character who is so different from all the other characters around him. There is no one even in the Bible that resembles Samson. And to be so, such a riddle, such a mystery, I think this is something that he had radiated also to us, to the Jews. It's not a matter of chance that he was chosen to be in the Bible and he got three chapters. Believe me, it's a very big portion of, of uh, Judges' book, the book of Judges, Sefer Shoftim. And if you read him, if you read Jacob, if you read Joseph, suddenly you, you see so much elements of us today, us, the Israelis today. You understand how our primal codes have been had been formulated back then, and how we continue to follow them, and how we continue to do the same mistakes sometimes, and how we have the same good qualities sometimes. And for me, reading the Bible is a very actual act, very relevant. I don't read only history when I read it. I read things that tell me about my life, my leadership, my, my government, my people, my army. Today, it's something part of, of life. Another question. How are we about time? I'm without a watch. Let me answer that, okay? <laughs> because there, there are so many people who want to ask questions. So. The gentleman asked if I'm not afraid of uh, one of the... Uh, I spoke about surrendering to a character. Am I not afraid that one of them will take over me? Well, I hope it will happen, yeah? I, no, but it's more complicated. It happens all the time. When I write a story, I, I so much become several characters, some of them contradictory to each other, hostile to each other. I like it. I like this inner, inner drama or inner game uh, within myself. And of course, after having written about certain characters, not all of them, not all of the characters that, that populate my, my books, but in every book there is one or two that as if I formulated the place of him or of her in myself. I know exactly now when I act like Momik, when I'm Aaron, when I'm Yair, when I'm Avram or Ora or Miriam. I know it now. I have this team within me, and it's a good feeling. Uh, when, when they take over in the process of writing, it's, it's wonderful. It's the best thing that can happen. You know, when, when I mean, you feel like an eagle catch you by the neck and take you behind your landscape takes you to places that you, you never dare to go. This is the best thing that, that can happen. When suddenly I'm able to, to write about mistakes of a character that I would not have done in my life, yes, being too reasonable, and suddenly being able to, to fall apart totally. What, what can be better than that? The lady up there. You almost answered one of my questions, but may I go back to someone to run with? I yeah. wondered about Asaf. And I had the feeling that Asaph, although it was written in the third person, 
was now that I meet you, was actually you. That it's just, you know, looking and being guided. And the dog was such a, it was like, like such a wind. Just the character was brought by the wind. And everything that was discovered, I felt, was coming through my eyes. And I thought was coming through the author's eyes. That's, that was uh, just a feeling I had. But my question to you is that I didn't see it as much as a love story, other than really a love story between... Tamar and her brother, it was just an ongoing, overwhelming love, but I found that the, you know, you talk about adolescence in the grander scale, but yet this was a very particular, very depressing group, and I said, I, I just, it was overwhelming to me, uh, and yet you look at it in a much lighter way as just looking at adolescence, I think, I'd like to hear you say more about it, and the, the love, the love that grew was was not a love of actual. It was more like an, almost like an intellectual kind of a coming to it. He wasn't attracted to her by by uh, physical or. It was the clues. It was something that kept bringing her and bringing her. It was the love of the process. So to me, it was two kinds of loves, and there was uh, so much despair because even if he is no longer going to be a drug addict. I mean, for the moment, sorry, the brother. The brother's problems are not solved. Nothing is really solved. They're not solved. And, and, yeah. And it was yeah, again, it's another, it's an, and I, 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 I'd rather not elaborate on that because I think we spoke so much about uh, someone to run with. Uh, it's, again, a story that if I had ended it in a conclusion, I think it would be too easy uh, for the reader to get away with it, yes? I, you are very right that if you read, if you, ever will re if you ever read this book for the second time, you see that there, there is this layer of even hopelessness because I don't know what will become of Shai, of the brother of, uh, of Tamar. He might easily fall back into, into drugs. Uh, and, I, well, I don't, probably I portrayed it in a more lighter <laughs> Air uh, because it's a book that I like to remember in a more cheerful way probably than than it is after the the the, the, the books that I had written after it and because it's for me it is a book of recovery yes it is a book of you know being able to win over over your own limitation but but I, I no I'm, I must tell I don't see myself in Asaf I see myself much more in Tamar. She is my character in the book, and uh, Asaf, I, s I, I know exactly who he is. He's very close to me, uh, but he's not me. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Can you, can you raise up your voice? How much of yourself as a child or as an adolescent uh, do you see in, uh, in this character like Momo or, or Aaron or these children and also just a remark about Aaron I felt that maybe he wouldn't get out of the refrigerator just because I felt that there was another child coming to sort of replace him so that was kind of uh, maybe pessimistic view but uh, just how much of yourself is a child a lot of me in every character every significant character that I write about even when it's not biographical uh, truth or facts, but sometimes there are characters that when I start writing about them, I have no idea why, why do they stick to me. And I really, I try, I, I, I feel I don't have any interest in writing this character and that this character is not really relevant to me. And gradually I understand why I should write about it. And then it becomes me. You know, maybe this is the, the difference or another reward of, of writing, because in our life, usually so many things of our life are dictated by people and circumstances and events that are not relevant for us, that are casual, that are random, that are arbitrary. I think of how much irrelevant people dictated my fate, my destiny. People with whom I wouldn't like to even to, to sit and to have coffee. And they influenced my life in, in a very dramatic way. When you write a story, nothing is irrelevant. Everything is relevant. Everything has a meaning. And, and this is something that is very hard to give up on. I think because of that, people are continuing 
to write, even when this work can be very frustrating sometimes. And the reward come after you know, years and years of, of hard effort. This feeling that the world become relevant and, and meaningful to me. Yes, yeah. I loved it in English. Thank I'm you. sure that if I could have read it in Hebrew, I probably would have loved it more. But can you talk a little bit about Theodora? <laughs> Theodora. <laughs> Theodora is a nun. <laughs> Actually, I invented her, and I know that there are two nuns, one in Jerusalem and one in Haifa, that claim to be the prototype of Theodora. <laughs> 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 yeah, but it's nuns. I mean, no nun. I'm hesitant now to say that most people haven't read the book because I guess that there is a group who read the book here, but I will just say one thing, uh, two things. One is that I like the idea of someone who is totally imprisoned, self-imprisoning herself, self-imprisoning in, in, in one room, one home for 50 years, never to get out, but has very active social life through letters. She corresponds with many people Many of them are in her situation because of various reasons. All over the world, she, she creates for herself this republic of the male, as she says, and, and she has full life. And I thought there is something to do with writer, the work of the writer in that, you know, that you live in your own room sometimes 12, 15 hours a day, and you write these letters and stories. And suddenly you go out to Toronto and you see people who have read your book and, and, and you touch people. But there is also something that I, that was important for me in Theodora. There is a moment in the end, towards the end of the story, that she understands that words are not enough, that you have to get out and to do things in reality. You have to, to rub your flesh against reality. Otherwise, it's only masturbation. You have to be out and, and to, to, to expose yourself to dangers and to, to do what it takes to be in, in this life. And, and I... Yeah, I think this is something one, one should follow. I'll just mention that in the end of the story, she goes out because she wants to save Tamar, the, the female main protagonist, who, who in a way she's in love with, but she of course doesn't realize that she's in love with, with Tamar. And she goes out after 50 years of being imprisoned in this home. Jerusalem has changed dramatically. And she goes out and she's, you know, amazed by the wealth of reality, by the riches of reality, all the noises, all the cars. She goes into Jaffa Road, which is the main road of Jerusalem, one of the most ugliest main roads in the whole world. You cannot imagine that this is the main road of a city like Jerusalem. But for her, it's, it's like heaven. And she falls on her knees and she prays. She gives thanks to God for everything he had created. And I left her there, and I continued the story, and the story ends in a very clear way, yes. Now, again, I was flooded by readers who demanded to know what happened to Theodora. <laughs> Why did I? Now, it's very touching, because it means that people were touched by her. But since there is not an office to follow literary uh, characters after they finish their job in, in the book, Another question. Yes, you. No, I don't have any any uh, just to to make things very clear. I'm a writer, and I will always be a writer. I don't, I'm, I don't have the slightest temptation to, to put my, myself in this uh, environment, to use a very clean word. But, but let, let's talk more seriously. Uh, I write a lot about uh, politics because I, I take my and our reality very, very seriously in Israel and very personally. And I want to change things. And I think that writers 
can help in changing things because by nature they see any reality from certain points of view, not only from our point of view, the Israelis, not only from the point of view of the Palestinians, but something that is more complicated and more, more rich and more real in a way because there is such a temptation to a nation like us who lives in war for so many years, for decades and decades, to be entrenched in one story that we tell ourselves. And we are entrenched because we are afraid, mainly. And our fears are not imaginary, of course. We are not paranoid. The, the Middle East is the most dangerous neighborhood on Earth today. And Israel have, has never been accepted, internalized into the Middle East, never. very reluctant peace, but these countries are out of the violent circle against us. Iraq is neutralized. If we, shall be, if we are courageous enough, we might create something with Syria, hopefully with the Palestinians. I know it sounds now like, like a dream, but there is still a very slight chance. But May I tell you, and let's agree to conclude with that. For years now, I think 30 years, I write and advocate peace. And I do it not only because it will solve the security problems of Israel, and not only because I am so passionate about having a Palestinian state. I want the Palestinians to have their state. Just I want to make it very clear. I want them to have a state. They deserve their state. I want them to be able to live life of, of dignity. I want them to have the chance to raise up their children without fear, without the humiliation of being occupied, without putting so much energies into this state of mind of being occupied that none of you can even start to imagine how dreadful it is and how humiliating it is. Just think of yourself being stopped for a minute by a policeman here in Toronto, a very kind, gentle Canadian policeman who hold you for five minutes and, and your kids are sitting behind and see how he treats you and just double it you know, hundred folds, and then you will understand what does it mean to, to be a Palestinian whenever you go from one village to another, you are being stopped, harassed, and most times humiliated. I want them to have their state, but this is not the main interest for me. If I thought that the Palestinian state would jeopardize Israel and not improve our situation, I would not have advocated it. I'm not blessed with such generosity and I'm not a self-destructive person, I'm sorry. I want to have peace because I believe that peace would allow us, the Israelis, to start to live the life we deserve to live. For so many years, we live only parallel to our life. For so many years, we invest most of our being, the life of our youngsters, all our, most of our creativity, budgets, obsession of mind with the question of the territories. For 40 years we are stuck with that. We pour all our energies into this question. The whole national debate for 40 years is around something that all of us know, most of us, let alone the fanatic and the hermetic people, know that this problem will be solved by, by separation. And yet, so much of our energy as a people, of our thinking, goes to there. Gershom Sholem once said in another context, all the blood goes to the wound. All our blood goes to this wound. And I think that when we have peace, we shall start to enjoy things that we cannot even dream about today in Israel because we are so fossilized in the current situation. We don't have the energy to uproot ourselves from it and to look behind this landscape. You know, first of all, we shall have borders. 
it's a very important thing to have a border. I want a border between us and Palestine to be. Not a wall, not this crazy wall that will only generate more and more stereotypes and hatred and prejudices and terror in the end. A border, and a border like exists between every two normal states, a border with gates to allow everything to move, but a border. We and them, we do not know the notion of a border, and it's very destructive for a people to not having this notion. You know, if you live life without borders, as we are, you know, we, Israel is 60 years old, all the time our borders have been violated and changed and moved in the north, in the south, in the east, because of the settlements that were planted there deliberately to obstacle any, fu any future solution, peace solution. There is only one solid border for us, this is the sea. <laughs> this is, we, we know. I, I, I think that if you live your life like that, it's like to, to be in a home that the walls are mobile all the time. You don't really know where you end, where the other starts. It creates this double-edged temptation of the others to invade you, of you to invade them. You are all the time on the temptation to, to overreact, to be over-aggressive, because you are not sure where, 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 are, where you end. I want borders. When we shall have peace, we shall have a sense that we have a future there. I know it sounds strange to you, because Israel seems like a very strong power there in the Middle East, but we are so... Deep inside, we feel so fragile, so uncertain about our being, about our future. You know, when you read in, in Canadian paper that Canada we, uh, plans its uh, roads plan for the years 2038, it sounds perfectly normal. No sane Israeli will make plans for 20 or 30 years from today. When, when I think of Israel in 2050, you know, I've... I feel like a pang in my heart, as if I allowed myself too much quantities of future. I violated the kind of a taboo. When we have peace, we shall have borders, we shall have future, we shall be in our place. You know, for so many years, we, the Jews, we survived to live our life. And now we, 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 we live to survive only. This is not enough. It is enough when you live in an extermination camp. But when you are the, the greatest superpower in the area, you have hundreds of atom bombs, allegedly, you have the best air force, and all what you aspire to is to survive from one catastrophe to another, this is not enough. How come we do not use this enormous power in order to leverage a more generous and courageous political, uh, uh, political uh, solution between us and, and our neighbors? It's always two in this tango. I do not put, put all responsibility on us, of course. The Palestinians are very efficient partners in obstacling, in, in creating buffers in front of, of of this option, but we have the upper hand, we are the occupier, we are much stronger, we have so much more room to maneuver and to be creative in this situation. We are doing almost nothing, almost nothing. It's amazing to see how little are we able to move, how we are victims of our fears. You know, I think Israel was created so we shall never be victims again, never depending on the goodwill or the bad will of others. Look at us such a gigantic superpower there, and we are such victims of our past trauma, of our fears, of the situation, of this paralys paralysis of, of, of the situation. And the last thing that I think we shall enjoy when we have all this will be something that is very difficult to explain. You know, you mentioned before larger than life, that this terminology. We, the Jews, throughout history, we are regarded as the people of the book, the Bible. But more than that, I think we provided stories, and larger than life stories to humanity. Since Genesis, the Bible, the myths of the medievals, Masada, the myth of Masada before it, the Shoah, the creation of Israel, the Six Day War, the Entebbe operation, the bringing up of the Ethiopian Jews, Every half year, there is a big story that Israel gives to the world. And, and I think, in a way, we are regarded as a story in eyes of others, not as a normal people, as a larger-than-life story. And I think that anyone who is larger than life, in a way, is not really tuned to life. 
in a normal, harmonious, even political way. And I don't want to be a larger-than-life story in Israel. I want to be a unique story among the other unique stories of all nations. Canadians are unique, Americans, Egyptians, Chinese, Italians, everyone is very unique. I don't want to be too much unique. Because when you are unique, you are not regarded as something real. That's what allowed peoples and religions and cultures to project upon us so many uh, superstitions and myths and legends and prejudices all throughout the years. They never really looked at us as human beings per se or as a people per se. And I think that only if we have peace, only when we have peace, we shall be granted this privilege to start to recover from this disease of our history and to start in a way to be more normal, more rooted in our land, in, within our borders, in the rhythm of time of having future and we shall enjoy then something that we never really enjoyed. It's very hard to even to articulate. It's something like solidity of existence. Something that is so well expressed in the prayer of Musaf in Shabbat afternoon, the Tita Enu Bigvulen, when plant us within our borders. This is something that we do not have. It's still only a kind of a vague idea for us. Usually we don't even know what we can aspire to. Solidity of existence. This is what, why we need peace more than anything else. This is why it is so existential and, and urgent for us. Thank you very much. Bye. that usually uh, the host of a, of, a, uh, of a lecture usually thinks, okay, what I'm going to say at the end, at the end of the lecture, to, to end the lecture. And the only thing I can, I can say now is, Eze Yofi, what a delight. <laughs> but I, I, I said, what a delight. <laughs>